Hi there everybody, welcome back to the channel. You're watching a Ritter Bit Will Do, and today, today is part two of Meet the Expert. Remember last week we were out at Yukon Acres, we were talking with Meadow Caulfield, and she is the person that's gonna help us with the beaver, right? Well, she also, we walked around that day and she was telling me all about the different things going on out at Yukon Acres. In this video, you're gonna see her talking about the birch trees, the cedar trees, and the tamarack trees. Uh, so it's it's pretty interesting stuff, guys. I hope that you watch the whole thing. Lots of cool stuff to learn. And by the way, make sure you make sure you hit that thumbs up button. All right, can you do that right now before we get started? All right, I'll give you a second. All right, get, you got it. All right, <laughs> here we go, guys. All right, so we came across a, a little stand of birch trees, and let's talk about these birch trees a little bit. What okay. Well, um, we talked about, you know, aspen earlier and how short-lived they are, and birch are not a very super long-lived species either. And uh, one of the things about birch trees is that they don't regenerate as well as they used to, and, and it's kind of becoming a concern in some forest management circles about regenerating birch trees. Yes. And in addition to that, though, is that birch right now is very trendy, and people yeah. like to look at birch bowls. They, they, they do. Yeah. They like them. Uh, my mother-in-law, <laughs> if you're watching, mother-in-law, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, because I cut these birch trees down for you, but Meadow has some advice for you. What would that advice for my mother, my dear mother-in-law be? Well, don't throw them away because you should save them because <laughs> they're a live product. Um, but yeah, it's a trend and it's not necessarily good for our forests. Yeah. And what's happening is that they're being poached. Yes. And you think it wouldn't be a big deal to poach a bunch of these poles, but right. they're getting a dollar pole and I see a lot of loads coming out and it's becoming an increasing issue on state and federal lands where people are poaching okay. things like spruce tops and birch poles. and that negatively impacts the forest because it doesn't yeah. it's it uh, they, they they have the a balance. marketable value but yes. which we wish that really didn't exist because it's it's hurting the regeneration yep. uh, and and you're telling me something about the uh, tolerance of okay yes temperature change that's right as well. and, and uh, one of the other things about birch is it's believed to be a climate change loser Climate change loser. Yeah. All right. And so some are winners, some are losers, and uh, there's a lot of theories about populations and species moving northward as the changes uh, occur. And you know, overall, our temperature is increasing very slowly, but yeah. we have these extreme swings, and some yeah. of those things impact birch. And so, on the North Shore, uh, is a good place to see a lot of that birch die off. Oh, really? It's theorized a lot of that has to do with climate change. And so, again, that's oh, okay. one of the things that they're concerned about is the you know, species diversity of the forest and the forest composition, when you don't have certain species like birch regenerating at the rate that it used to, yeah. um, then it becomes a concern. Now, now are there different types of species of birch? Because yeah. I've heard of a yellow birch. We do. We have a yellow birch. This is the paper birch. So this is a paper birch. Yep, Betula okay. piperifera. And then we have... Um, Say that again for our audience. <laughs> Betula piperifera. <laughs> so it refers to the paper. Paper. That'll be on the test, you guys. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then I'm trying to remember Betula... Alleghenensis, I think, is the yellow birch. Don't quote me on that one. I'm probably completely wrong. Right. I cannot remember, but, uh, <laughs> but we do have a yellow birch. And yellow birch tends to grow in wet areas. Okay. So in bogs, and it's typically associated, it, a lot of times it will sprout on an old stump. Oh, all right. And, uh, yeah, so I've the, seen that. Yeah, yep. and so the roots will actually grow down off a stump or a rock or an elevated mound. Yeah. So a lot of times you have these weird buttress-shaped roots. Right. But they have a very yellow shape or yellow color. It's almost a golden color, and they look really yeah. shaggy. That The the, the, bird, the bark does not shed in sheets like on paper birch. This is a young young individual. You see some over right. here. This one's starting yeah. to shed in sheets. But that's one of the reasons they call it paper. It's like paper. But yellow birch is yellowish gold, kind of shaggy. They get they do get older. I've seen some pretty massive yellow birch, and then they smell like spearmint or peppermint. Okay. So the yeah. twigs do. That's not one of the identifying factors. But <laughs> yeah, so we do have two species of birch here in northern Minnesota, but you have, I have yet to see a yellow birch, but uh, you have the paper birch. And yellow birch is relatively uncommon, so it's okay. not, not a common species. And usually, again, wet, rich So areas. you've yet to see a yellow birch out here? On your property. Okay, yeah, yep. yeah. I think I, I think I know where some yellow birch are. And if you guys have followed the channel, um, out at the cabin, I'm pretty sure those are yellow birch because they're right on the side of a lake shore. Okay. They, they have been growing twigs from the stump scenario. And I, okay. I would I would be willing to bet that's a yellow birch. Real bird. brassy golden bark that's kind of shaggy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when they get bigger, they have big plaques on the on the uh, trunk, so they're not oh, they okay. don't have you know, obviously the paper is farther up the trunk as yeah, the bark yeah, forms. But. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. thanks for that. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> We're learning a lot here, so <laughs> we'll see what happens. We are back here at one of my favorite places of the property. This is what I've always referred to as the cedar swamp. And if you look around, we've got we've got a lot of different cedars. And uh, Meadow was just telling me a little bit about these cedars. What, what type of cedar trees are we looking at here? So we're in northern white cedar. And um, 
they, one of the things we were talking about is that how difficult it is for them to regenerate. Yeah. They, and yeah. They, they don't pop up. I don't see. I don't see a whole lot of young cedars. No. And so there's a very narrow range of conditions that cedar will regenerate under, and usually low deer densities because okay. deer love cedar. Cedars are very important thermal cover, but it's also important important source of food in the winter time when food sources are scarce. Yeah. And so um, one of the ways that you can regenerate cedar is that you can plant it, but then you have to protect it with a cone or some sort of protective barrier from oh, rocks. All right. And that takes a lot of dedication, a long time. But normally, in a normal conditions, it it's a, regenerates on mineral soil. So you have these tip ups here, and um, so the the anywhere there's dis a d disturbance or exposure of the mineral soils, where there's a tip up or a windstorm. No mineral soil. Define we define mineral soil. Okay, so I, mean, I, I kind of think I know what it means. But okay, yeah, make so sure that I know what it means. Soil is layered in horizons, right? It takes okay. tens of thousands of years for soils to form, oftentimes. Okay. And so we have these different horizons, and towards the top we have an organic horizon, which is prim primarily organic materials. So things like leaves, um, any sort of herbaceous or uh, grass vegetation, mm -hmm. uh, twigs, all those things, it's just organic matter. But then we get down to the mineral soils, and that's where you actually have raw minerals. So things like sands and coarser gravels, etc. Okay. And in some cases, clay. And so when uh, some of these species in Minnesota require exposure to mineral soils in order to establish uh, a root system. And, and it also it's kind of like a blank slate. There's no competition there, so they actually yeah. have a chance to establish. Maybe their seedlings aren't as good as competitors. So, oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, so cedar again establishes in very narrow range of conditions. It's not very common in Minnesota. It used to be much more common, mm -hmm. and our deer densities are much higher than they used to be pre European settlement, so now we have less of it regenerating. It's actually a conservation concern. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, especially thermal cover in the summer. We yeah. call it the deer yard, so the deer actually migrate to areas uh, with heavy cedar cover. To yeah, in the, the, the deer have been back here quite a bit. As you can, you can see, the deer have a, <laughs> a nice little trail through these cedars. So they, mm -hmm. they, this is one of their favorite places too, I think. So yes. me and the deer kind of like the same place. So the cedar here, obviously you can see most of them are leaning. Now is that pretty common for the white cedar at this yeah, and uh, some of it has to do potentially with w what we call wind throw. Yeah. And so um, we walk through a young stand of aspen. Yep. And so what happens, they likely reserved the cedar. So they yeah. protect it. They don't log it. So they put in what we call a reserve when they're um, doing the, the uh, forest harvest plan. Okay. And so this was reserved. But then what happens is these trees grew up with those trees. Yes. And so they have root structure and physical structure, above ground structure that supports them under the condition that they have neighbors present. Yeah. And so a lot of times what people do, especially when you build a house, okay. they'll have cedars nearby and they'll, they'll thin everything else, especially on lake shores. Yeah. And then they're dismayed that all their cedars tip over in the oh, first yeah, few yeah. windstorms. So sure. that partially what may be what happened here is that when they harvested that, that makes on sense. state land, yep, yep. it tipped all these over. Yep. So. Yeah, because so, so the, the there's some timber back there where the state had harvested, so that kind of left that, that whole area open. All the wind had plenty of velocity to just kind of come through here and, and move these cedars over. So and cedars have very shallow root systems, so they because they typically right. are growing in wet areas, so they keep their roots close to the surface of the soil so they can breathe. That those shallow, shallow root systems, in company with losing your neighbor, mm -hmm. they have a tendency to tip. So if I were to come out here and and cut some of these cedar down, mm -hmm. it, it, they're not going to regenerate by themselves because um, they don't do that, do they? Well, they they won't regenerate like an aspen or they'll, right. they'll the, uh, most conifers don't stump sprout and mm -hmm. they don't root sprout. And I can't say for 100% that it won't happen on occasion. The only real conifer that stump sprout is the redwood trees in western U.S. Oh, okay. Oh, no um, kidding. Yeah. Okay. yeah Interesting. So in Minnesota, under our current deer populations, it takes effort a lot of times to regenerate cedar, especially upland cedar. So oh, well, that's, yeah. that's, that's another wealth of information here, guys. <laughs> We're learning a lot, aren't we? All right. Um, make sure that you document your credits and then turn it in to the class later. <laughs> <laughs> all right we're going to keep wandering around we may find something else to talk about we may not it, it worked out well today i have nothing but time to wander around the property and uh and, and meadow's kind of in the same boat it's a sunday yeah we're kind of just enjoying what what temperature we got we've got know. 45 degrees right it's, now it's a sunny beautiful yeah, sunday oh man. this is this is beautiful in yeah. march and so in minnesota in march when you get a day like this it's like celebration for us that survived the winter <laughs> yeah yeah as you can see we're in we're in light jackets yeah. no gloves no hat it, it, nah, it's a warm nah, day for us it's a nice day. <laughs> all right let's keep going we found something else to talk about so th tell them what we're going to talk about here okay so what we're looking at is one of these larger cedar trees and we found uh, some on this other uh tree but we've got some larger holes from uh, large 
woodpecker is a pileated or pileated woodpecker, depending on how you pronounce it. Pileated or pileated, depending on the region of the yep, world you live the in. the pile uh, in relation to a crest on their head. Okay. They're fairly large woodpecker. Yeah, they're huge. Yeah, yeah. and so they have a... They're like the woody woodpecker. That is based, based on, on another species, I think. Well, okay, no, let's move But on. yes, they, but they, they are very, they are our example of woody oh woodpecker. I want to say that's a red cockaded woodpecker, but no, I'm not 100% sure. All right. But um, these guys uh, make these rectangular to round, typically rectangular in shape holes. And you see um, the shape, this is not the best example, but in a living tree, oftentimes they're restricted by the um, sapwood. Okay. Because it's alive. The heartwood is what they're after. Because yeah. there's rot inside of there, and then there's a lot of insects like carpenter ants and beetle larvae that they're after. Right. And uh, you can see a lot of times in the winter time, one of the telltale signs oh, is you yeah. start to see chips. Yeah, sure. it's just like, especially sure. on top of the snow, there's like cedar yeah. chips and uh, any species of tree, but that's what they're after. And they, we were just discussing that they actually have, their, their tongue is actually retracted up over their skull and attaches to one of their nostrils right for the last one I scunned for taxidermy. Mm -hmm. And then it actually can, ex once they get a hole big enough and they can get in there, they can use their tongue as a harpoon. It actually has backward facing barbs on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now you mentioned taxidermy. Yes. Okay. Now, she does taxidermy too. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Okay. Um, I do a little bit of avian taxidermy yeah. here in northern Minnesota. And so I do client work. And yeah. then I also do a lot of work for the college. So I've been working on our vertebrate uh, collection there. So. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. So you do some work for the college that you teach at, mm -hmm. so you have some displays. Yes, at the so I teach wildlife and forest <laughs> that's ecology That's amazing. There. Yeah, and so I've yeah. been working on a vertebrate, we call it the vertebrate teaching a collection. Yeah. In my ride, we didn't have a collection of all, and of any sort. There was a little bit of an osteology or skull collection, mm -hmm. but otherwise it's hard to make connections for students that may have never even seen these species without physically touching them. Right, or you need to see them, them you need to look at them, you need to study yeah. them. Yeah. Right, just like an anatomy lab, I had to take anatomy lab. That wasn't very fun. I <laughs> failed, in fact. I had to take it again. <laughs> but but taxidermy with animals, yeah. I, you know, I would find that fascinating as as you do, and that's really cool. I do. So, I think so it's you, cool. you've been doing taxidermy for how many years now? Uh, 15 years. About 15 years you've yep. been doing that? All right. And you're just you're starting to get a, a clientele base. And, yeah. And so this is the first year I've actually had a license, state and federal, to do client work. All right. So you have to be a licensed taxidermist in order to accept money. Or, uh, or anything really in exchange okay. for your work. Yeah, all yeah, right. It's regulated, and so... Um, so now you're a regulated taxidermist. Yes, I'm a regulated taxidermist here in Minnesota. Really so, cool, yeah. really cool. So if people <laughs> wanted to get a hold of you, yeah. we could we could probably put some information maybe below here. And yep. I have a YouTube channel. It's not... There's no tax around there. There's some informational yeah. videos on grouse right. aging. And hey, I'll, I'll put a link to her YouTube channel in the description. So if you want to check out a little bit more about Meadow over here, yeah, she's a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> Just, just amazing. I, I lucked out here finding, <laughs> running into meadows. <laughs> All right, well, let, let's keep wandering and see what else we can chat Sounds about. Good. You guys remember last fall, I was talking about my tamarack trees? Well, I figure as, as long as I got the right person who is a little knowledgeable, she's going to tell us what's going on here with this tamarack. All right, well, uh, in Minnesota, we have a, we're losing a lot of our tamarack to large beetle. And, uh, large can, beetle. Yeah, so we got these uh, galleries. This is not a very good example. They're, a lot of times in the bark, completely strips off you can see it but there's a series of galleries here from these beetles as they eat the cambium layer so basically they essentially girdle the tree and that's how okay. um, they kill them but you'll notice them you'll see these bare patches of wood and the woodpeckers are pulling chips of bark off getting yeah. at those beetle larvae in the winter time that's a lot of times how you first notice it and of course the trees don't flush again All right. when they die if i were to cut that tree down Yep. and harvest it as firewood. What's the inside of it going to look like? Is it going to be hollowed out or is it going to be pretty decent yet? It depends on the tree, yeah. but um, it's a good chance, you know, it's, it should be pretty solid inside. Pretty but solid? Hard right. to say. It depends on the tree, you know. They, yeah. they do some salvage logging of it. Because sometimes tamarack is desirable for lumber. Yes, it's yeah. a, it got a lot of chemicals in it that resist rot. So yeah, it yeah, it does. Yeah. A little bit like cedar kind of holds exactly. up. Um, it's a very hard wood. Well, I got an uncle who has a sawmill, one of those portables, and uh -huh. I've never talked about that on camera yet, but maybe that tree will end up on his sawmill. We yeah, can get some two by fours. Yeah, a pretty good size it. one, really. Yeah, that's a good one. That's yeah. a good size. And it's straight for about 20 feet up there. Yeah. Yep. Well, all right, so lar larch beetle. Yep. All right, well, some, somebody in my comments of the video about the tamarack tree before said it was larch beetle. You're right. Good job for you. Extra credit, right? Yes, extra, extra credit. credit. Get extra points. <laughs> extra points for you. <laughs> so good job. All right. Um, we're running out of juice on this battery, so I think this is probably going to be the last time we see you today. Yeah. But we're definitely going to have you back, Meadow. It's, it's been really fun to tour yes. Yukon Acres with you, <laughs> and I've learned 
a ton of stuff. I, uh, more than we've talked to you guys. I, I'm, I'm learning so much, my brain hurts, okay? <laughs> so thanks for tuning in, guys. As always, until next time, keep on tractoring and God bless. <laughs>